Welcome again to our August Veggie Happenings. This event is presented by the Food Gardening Specialist Group of the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County. Before, we've always talked about how to grow a successful food garden, and now it's time to enjoy the fruits of all those labors. So are your tomatoes ripe? Did you have more than you could use last year? Today, our special guests are the Sonoma County Master Food Preservers, who will show us many ways to use and preserve our tomatoes that we'll be harvesting over the next few months. Um, before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, in this webinar, the attendees audio and video will be off. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. It's probably at the bottom of your sc screen. And um, during our question period after our speakers, we will be answering only the questions that show up in the question and answer box. Um, but do check out the chat for other links to recipes and other resources from the Master Gardeners and the Master Food Preservers. The Zoom talk is being recorded, but since your audio and video are off, you have no danger of having your photo or your voice being recorded. Um, the recording will be available in about a week on the Mass, excuse me, Sonoma County Master Gardener YouTube channel. And we hope to also do a link on the Facebook page for the Master Food Preservers. So you may not be familiar with the Master Food Preservers. They're relatively new in Sonoma County. And our mission is to keep Californians safe. Um, we're guided by the University of California Cooperative Extension. And the volunteers are certified by the University of California. And we're guided by our statewide um, UC Master Food Preserver program. Our core, per core mission, somewhat like Master Gardeners, is to teach research based information. And this is on home food preservation practices to keep the residents of California safe and well as they use these practices to safely preserve food in their homes, reduce food waste, and increase food security. We might use and mention various products and brands throughout this presentation. These are only examples and are not endorsements or recommendations of specific brands or products. The Master Food Preservers have a tremendous amount of guidance on safe ways to preserve food on our website. And it's not just canning, that's kind of what most of us think of preservation, but you're going to learn a lot today about things other than canning. And on these sites, you'll find links to videos, recipes, and upcoming events that you may want to join. In addition, we've compiled a tomato preservation resources page link with links specific to today's presentations. You can search for food gardening resources on the Master Gardener website, or the easy way is to capture this QR code with your smartphone. The QR code will take you directly to the, to the tomato preservation resources page. I'll show this code again later if you don't have your smartphone handy right now. The Master Food Preservers sharing their knowledge with us today are Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr, who will be sharing interesting tomato and safety facts with us and talking about which types of tomatoes are best for which applications. Suzanne Young and Shannon Kuhn will show you how to blanch and peel tomatoes and how to make tomato song. Toby Brown and Steve Selleck will demonstrate how to safely can tomatoes and tomato sauce. By the end, you'll know how to use everything except the core of those precious tomatoes. So let's get started. Kathleen Fitzgerald Orr is also a master gardener with specialties in food gardening and integrated pest management. She's been canning since childhood and took the master food preserver course at the University of Idaho in 2012. She was also involved in reactivating the master food preserver program here in Sonoma County. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I will start with a short uh, slideshow that emphasizes the safety measures that must be taken in order to um, make sure that your tomatoes are saved in a safe and um, uh, way that is not going to cause um, any, any harm. Next slide, please. 
So tomatoes, they are one of the most popular vegetables to be preserved at home. They can be safely canned at home by using simple research-based recipes to ensure their safety. They can be processed in a water bath, atmospheric steam canner, or a pressure canner. Next slide, please. We always address basic food safety at the beginning of our presentations. Of course, the first one is wash your hands frequently. Avoid cross-contamination. When in doubt, throw it out. Rinse all fresh vegetables and fruits under well-running water before preparing or eating them. Clean them with a clean cloth or paper towel. Always wash your hands, knives, cutting boards, and other surfaces with soapy water before or after any contact with raw meat, fish, or poultry. Also keep in mind, we do not rinse our poultry uh, prior to um, either cooking or preserving it. Um, it's just another way that you will spread um, microbial problems. Use a disinfecting solution of one and a half teaspoons of chlorine free bleach to one pint of water. Use a spray bottle and dis disinfect all your working surfaces. Let it sit for one moment and then wipe dry. If possible, make a new solution daily. Next slide, please. Safe preservation practices. Safely preserving tomatoes in our home begins by choosing only disease-free firm fruit for canning. Do not can tomatoes from dead or frost killed vines because they have a high microbial load that is unsafe to consume or preserve. Green tomatoes are more acidic than ripened fruit. Yellow tomatoes are not any lower in acid than red ones. They contain more sugar and therefore tend to have a sweeter taste. You can use any color of tomato when canning if you follow the acidification process. Next slide, please. pH, very important when you're preserving. When tomatoes are processed or home canned, the safety of the product depends on the amount of acid in the tomato. The amount of acid in food is recorded as the pH level. Foods with a pH level of one to 4.6 are considered high acid. Those with a pH value between 4.6 and 7.0 are considered low acid and cannot be preserved by water bath canning. Next slide, please. Here's a, a chart showing the differences in uh, acid levels a P, at a pH above 4.6. Clostridium botulinum is able to grow and produce a deadly, to deadly toxin unless the food is heated to high temperatures in a pressure canner. Next slide, please. Tomato acidity. Tomatoes require a certain amount of acidity for safe home canning. The acid, it, acid is added almost to all tomato products before canning, even those that are pressure canned. To ensure safe acidity in whole crushed or juiced tomatoes and two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice or one half teaspoon of citric acid per quart of tomatoes. For your smaller jars for pints, use one tablespoon of bottled acid juice, lemon juice, or one quarter teaspoon of citric acid. This is called the acidification process and needs to be followed religiously. Always follow an up-to-date research tested recipe and always use bottled lemon juice for a consistent pH level. This is because there's no way to discern what the pH level of your um, lemons at home might be at. Next slide, please. This chart, a um, little, little difficult to read, I apologize for that, but it deals with the pH levels of tomato and salsa with and without lemon juice. You can see in the far left corner, every single one of those values is above the 4.6 point. So they are low acid tomatoes. With the addition of pH, of, of lemon juice, I'm sorry, the pH then falls below that, that um, break off point. And again, here on the right is salsa without adding lemon juice. And again, you're gonna run into problems. You need to add either the citric acid or the lemon juice. Next slide, please. So varieties from our gardens and how to use them. Next slide. 
snack tomatoes. These, uh, in my experience, rarely make it into the home, into the house. Um, the grape tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and especially these beautiful heirloom tomatoes tend to be eaten right out in the garden at their freshest point. Next slide, please. Salads. We're all aware grape tomatoes and cherry tomatoes make wonderful additions to our, our summer salads. Next slide, please. Canning tomatoes. Only boiling water or pressure canning methods are recommended for canning foods. Older methods such as oven canning and open kettle canning have been discredited and can be hazardous. The USDA and university-based researchers have determined that to ensure a safe acid level for boiling water canning of whole crushed or juiced tomatoes, the acidification process needs to be followed to ensure this uh, safety. Next slide, please. Heirloom tomatoes. The heirloom tomato is generally considered to be a variety that has been passed down through several generations of a family because, it's value, because of its valued characteristics. These tomatoes produce fruits that are perfect for preserving. And I've listed some of our favorite, uh, my favorite um, heirloom tomatoes. And uh, there are a variety of colors and um, just very, uh, so delicious to prepare and save for uh, coming seasons. Next slide, please. So paste tomatoes, what makes a paste potato, a tomato? Um, they have less water content and usually fewer seeds. Varietals known for being paste tomatoes boast a more dense, drier flesh and fewer seeds, making them meaty, thick, and ready to turn into a rich sauce to top your favorite pasta. Most paste tomatoes are elongated, especially those that are traced back to Italian paste tomatoes. And here are some favorite varieties, the Amish paste, Black Prince. One that was new to me this year is the Granadero and um, other varieties. Next slide, please. So tomato juice. Again, make sure to acidify the tomatoes before canning as this ensures harmful, harmful toxins cannot grow. Use a research tested recipe for tomato juice. Choose fruit that is fully ripe and generously sized with a firm texture and naturally juicy pulp. Some of the varieties to consider are Roma and Mescali, Black Crim, Solar Flare, and Ant Ruby's German Green. Next slide, please. Roasting tomatoes, which I've been doing quite a bit recently. Um, this process works best with large paste type tomatoes, such as Roma, San Marzino, Amish paste, but it can also be done with other tomatoes, not to mention adding other things from your garden at the same time, such as your summer squash and onions, and just let your imagination run with um, how to put together a very um, wonderful uh, roasting tomato sauce. Next slide. So we go back to a final reminder, we need to use the right product and use the right process. And this has to do with, you know, whether your tomato is high acid or if you're dealing with a low acid situation. Boiling water canning, which includes water bath as well as atmospheric steam canning can be used for high acid foods. Pressure canning is what is used for low acid foods. And our last slide, um, this is a, a page of tomato resources. These are all uh, resources that are science-based and these will be available um, when our uh, production goes to the YouTube video. And thank you for watching. Thanks, Kathleen, that was great information. Our next section is about blanching, roasting and peeling tomatoes and making to tomato salt. Suzanne went to pastry school, worked in cooking schools and became a master food preserver because cooking is her passion. She has a collection of over 1000 cookbooks. Shannon has a prolific garden and gives a lot of produce away. 
She thought joining the Master Food Preservers would be a good way to learn to preserve the bounty and learn new ways to make use of her vegetables and tomatoes. Suzanne and I are going to show you basically today how to make use of tomato skins. And we're going to do that by blanching and by roasting. But first, we want to show you some of the end product that you get to enjoy when you take some time and use the tomato skins instead of putting them in the compost. So tomato skins can be like potato chips. Thin and crispy. I hope you can hear that sound. So we're going to make use of these tomato skins to make tomato salt. You can see this. This tomato salt, Suzanne has made ahead of time, and we're gonna make some of that today so you can see how it's done. And tomato powder. Now this is just at least six tomatoes. So to, uh, Suzanne's gonna tell you a bit more about which tomatoes to choose, but it took six tomatoes dehydrated to make this tomato powder. So. Now this is the beautiful tomato salt that Suzanne made. And she's gonna tell you how about to do that after I show you how to blanch and how to use roasted tomatoes for the end product. And we also wanted to show you the different selections of salts. We have a mold and salt, which is a large flaky salt. This is a beautiful Hawaiian salt that Suzanne used to make her salts today. And then, we have a French salt. So you can use different salts. And then I used a garlic salt to go ahead and use to roast the tomatoes. So again, the first thing you always want to do, wash your hands. Wash your hands good before you touch any food products. And as you're working in the kitchen, continue to wash your hands. So the first thing you want to do is you want to get your tomatoes prepared for the blanching. Before we quite do that, let's take the tomatoes out of the oven because they're ready. They have been baking for 25 minutes. Now look at these beautiful tomatoes. There we go. I commonly put olive oil on my tomatoes, basil, oregano, and some garlic salt. Like I said, I bake them for about 25 minutes. And I use a small quantity of the roasted tomatoes with the blanched tomatoes. We take the skins and I mix them together, but it's usually like an eighth of the roasted tomato skins with the majority being the blanched tomato skins. Because when you blanch the tomatoes, you get the large skins like this to come out. It's a little bit harder with the roasted tomatoes. Okay, so as you can see on the stove, we've got two large pots of water here. And when you blanch a tomato, you've already poured the tomato in the center. And then you mark an X on the bottom. And you get them all prepared ahead of time. And then you're going to blanch them for 15 seconds and take them out quickly. Pretty easy to do. And you did this as well, Suzanne, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we put them in there. We're all ready to go. Sorry about my back. One. Two, three, four, six. We'll just use five, right? So seven, eight, I'm counting my seconds. Okay, right? I think we're about there. Seems like we are. Yeah, absolutely. So based on doing this on film, some of the time factor we take into consideration. So now, what are we going to do with these? Well, we can freeze tomato skins, we can dry tomato skins, or we can fry the tomato skins. And today, Suzanne and I are not going to fry them. Today, we're gonna dry them. Thank you. 
the blanching is the easiest way to get the tomato skins off gently. Kind of a fast and furious process. It's off. So our tray, may I have the tray? Thanks. And being part of the program through the UC system, the, the uh, recipes we use are the research-based recipes. So anything we're promoting today, we promote as a research-based recipe, absolutely. As you can see, they come off very easy. Now, Suzanne tends to do hers in the oven at home. Is that right, Suzanne? Yes, when you I do, do the drying. Yeah, I do. Um, because not everyone has a dehydrator, so it's important, you know, that we make it flexible for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we should mention on these tomatoes, since you're going to be using the skins, you should probably buy organic tomatoes if you don't have homegrown or if you can't go to a farmer's market, because we are using the skins. So we do recommend that you use organic. Right. And remember, the skins are really nutritional, full of vitamin C, antioxidants. So it's like when you do any cooking, commonly we try to make use of the skins for the nutritional benefit. I mean, when you're growing anything in the garden, it comes up through the vine, and that's where all the nutrition is. So well, it's not, nice not to waste the skins, you know, not to put them in the compost. It's nice to be able to have something to be able to use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can see how easy they come off. Now, when you bake them in the oven, you commonly you put them in the oven around 200 and you bake them two to three hours, checking on them, turning them if you need to, right? And flipping them. Now I use a dehydrator. You can see mine back here in the corner. This is an older dehydrator, almost 30 years old. It's not even on the market anymore. Mm -hmm. This is an Oster and it does not have a thermostat. And I do have to move the trays, but that's okay. I, I don't mind it. Now to dehydrate the skins, it takes about seven, eight hours. It's a lot longer. A lot longer. Yeah, a lot longer. And so the benefit of the oven, you know, to me, it's just as good, sufficient, a lot less time. And the dehydrator is noisy. So but this time of year, you can put them outside too. That's right. That's right. So I'm not going to peel all these, but at least you can see, once you put the X on the bottom, some come off a little easier than others. Now that was a really good oh, one. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right. So again, a couple different ways. Freeze them, dry them, and fry them. Now, I haven't fried them yet, but I'm having a feeling it'd be good like French fries, yeah, you know, and, and fast, furious olive oil sure. with a lot of salt and garlic. Now, the oven is on. So, we'll put this in the oven next, and then we're going to look at the roasted ones. Side. A couple more. Back. Now, what do we want to use all this for, Suzanne? What do we want to use well, the, the powder and the salt for? Well, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice addition to things, especially if it's made of salt. You can use it um, to enhance your tomato flavor, like with um, if you're going to make a tomato sauce or a spaghetti sauce. It's also wonderful if you're going to do the, you know, fresh tomatoes, maybe a little burrata, a little bit of basil on top, and then sprinkle it with the tomato salt. It's just, it just adds that other dimension that is really good. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's how I use my tomato salt. And the tomato powder, again, it's almost like a, um, intense flavor that you can put in soups and stews and things like that. And, Shannon and I were talking earlier, it's very expensive to buy tomato powder and, oh. and hard to find. So uh, this is just a wonderful way, especially this time of year when you've got jillions of tomatoes that you're canning for all different reasons. So um, 
Yeah, that's what I use it for. Look at how yeah. wonderful. Beautiful. See, a little longer of blanching, a little thicker, almost like the leather, like yeah. a leather. Beautiful. That's right. So here that's are right. the roasted. All right. Mm -hmm. Here, we can move this in and set those over there. So again, the roasted have a lot of flavor, but they're just a little more challenging to take off the meat. <laughs> <laughs> what a difference, hey? What would that be like, Shannon, if you roasted them without the skins? Roasted them without the skins? Do you so think they would fall apart if you didn't have the skin on it now when you roasted them? Um, probably would. Probably would. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. So I think blanching, the, and the, the point of the story is that yeah, the blanching is the way to go. I do too. And then when you have all these beautiful big tomatoes left over from taking uh, off the skin, yep. then I'll probably make sauce with these this afternoon. Yep. Absolutely. Or you can put them in the freezer if you don't want to do it when it's so hot. You can freeze those. That's right. Just hold like that. That's right. And then, and a good way to freeze them too is to do it individually on a sheet tray. Sort of flash freeze them. And then they're hard when you put them in your bag. So you could pull out one at a time if you wanted to, rather than having them all smooshed together. Okay. Great. Great. So let's put these in the corner. Okay. Great. So see now. So the next thing that we're going to do is get things ready for the salt, right? Absolutely. Okay, let's take this back and start getting the salts ready. Working in a little kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's nice. It's cozy. Uh, okay, we're going to make salt. And to make salt, you only need two ingredients. You need the tomato skins and you need salt. And we'll just use this Hawaiian salt. It's kind of fun and kind of interesting. Um, whenever I'm in Hawaii, I always buy this salt because I like the flavor. It's very, very natural flavor. Okay, what we need to do um, is scale, okay? Just a regular kitchen scale, all right? And mm -hmm. I need that little bowl, mm -hmm. okay? So we're gonna temper this bowl to get it down to zero. And we will put the skins in here, right there. Let's put them in there. Oops. And we have two and five eighths ounces of skin. Okay. So next, we're going to take this little guy in here. Tap that. And then we're going to put two and five eighths ounces of salt. So I'm going to do like this. It sure looks like a lot of salt. It does. It does. And when I first did this, I thought, oh my gosh, that's so much salt. But we have to remember we're making salt. So <laughs> right. it makes sense. Um, there's two ways you can go with the sheet tray. You can use the parchment or you can use something called a silk pad which is this little silicone pad. So we'll just put that on here. Okay. And then we will put our tomato skins on here like this and kind of separate them. Don't get them so that they're too smushed because they won't get as crispy as we want them to make salt. All right, and so you put those on there. Now we take the salt and we sprinkle it over here like this. Yeah, it looks like a lot of salt, but that's what we're making. And then you take these skins and you put them in the 200 degree oven and you roast them for about two to two and a half hours is what I find is the best. Um, and you can also dehydrate them, but you know, everyone's got an oven, so these in the oven. And this is what comes out of the oven. I'm going to give a couple of these to Angie, and she's going to throw them in 
a spice grinder, okay? And we've got a spice grinder here. This, um, you can use just a coffee grinder, but dedicate it for this type of use. Another tip is between uses, you can grind rice in it, which neutralizes it, so you can use it for different products. So we're gonna throw a couple of these in here, and I kind of mush them when I put them in there, so that they will grind a little bit easier. Let's put a few more. Mm -hmm. Let's put a few more. Um, all right, so I'll take that over you there. You take that over there. Right. And she's going to give a little, a few grinds so that we'll show you. This is also a great little gift for people. You like um, so we ground. Um, yeah, you know, maybe different than a jam or a jelly. I know we all are giving out jams and jellies and stuff, but people love this. And, you know, you put a little card on it and say, use it to enhance tomato flavor. Um, okay, so how here is our salt. <laughs> and it's nice, and you just put it on top of something. And... I think we've used things that you don't normally use. Right. I mean, I have chickens, and I know a lot of other people on our program have chickens, yeah. and they would be getting these, but not anymore. Oh. Not <laughs> for me. Not for you. And okay. remember, you can use the powder, like Suzanne talked about, for cooking sauces, soups. You know, if you have children or grandchildren, you can use the salt or the powder for, like, on pizza, pasta, salad. I mean, whatever the kids want it on, you know, try to get them ready to get into the tomato taste, right? Okay. I think we covered mostly everything, Suzanne. So basically, freeze, fry, dry, right? Yep. Tomato powder, tomato salt. Just make sure you keep everything and use it up. So thanks, Suzanne and Shannon, for helping us use all of our tomatoes. Um, that was so cool watching you do that. The, um, Suzanne and Shannon will also be answering questions that you've submitted in the Q&A. Now, maybe you were wondering about those peeled tomatoes that went off in the other dish. After you've peeled tomatoes, you may want to use them for canning or making tomato sauce. Toby and Steve are going to demonstrate that for us. Toby is a master gardener and a food gardening specialist with a huge veggie garden. She uses the information from Master Food Preservers to get the most out of her garden and help others to do the same. Steve is a semi-retired consultant and business owner and a new Sonoma County resident. Steve and his husband, Alan, planted olive and fruit trees and a vegetable garden on their Dry Creek property. Steve joined Master Food Preservers to learn more about safe food preservation methods and to share that information with others in Sonoma County and beyond. My name is Toby Brown and this is Steve Selleck. And we are gonna tell you, show you how to preserve tomatoes by canning today. So um, the first thing I wanna let you know, here's some tomatoes I picked out of my garden. And so you can see that we, I need to can, definitely. Um, I, there's a variety of colors, but the first thing is tomato season is relatively short and we love tomatoes. So the first thing I want you to do is eat as many of those tomatoes as you possibly can. They're the most nutritious uh, when they're, they're fresh. So I've got a crack on that one. And um, you've, you didn't have to go any place to get the tomatoes. You, it's great for the environment. So eat as many as you can. And then you can go through and preserve your tomatoes. So there's lots of ways to preserve tomatoes, and I know my favorite way. What do you like to do, Steve? Uh, so far, I've really just focused on uh, make tomato sauce and just freeze it. I haven't actually canned tomatoes yet before, so I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more about that today. Awesome. So I will teach you how to do that. So um, there's lots of ways you can preserve, and I've talked about some of those already. Dehydrating, you can take with the canning, you can freeze whole tomatoes, you can freeze tomatoes, sauce. You can freeze them when you haven't cooked them, which is a cold pack, a hot pack when you have. But honestly, what we're going to do today is what I like to do all the time, and it's sauce. And I do sauce because it's just basic. And when you look on your shelf, you want to you use these jars. Here's some jars that I've canned this year. Um, this one was all red tomatoes. This one 
was yellow tomatoes, and this one was a mix. So you can see it really doesn't make a difference. So don't say, oh, I have to have paste tomatoes in order to can, absolutely not. You just go out and you get whatever you've got in your garden and you can do it. Don't waste those tomatoes. So for sure too, think about your neighbors and anybody around you who is saying, oh, my tomato plants aren't doing well, offer them some, but preserve the rest. So um, we're gonna show you some recipes today, one recipe in particular, and it's from So Easy to Preserve. There's lots of resources out there, but always use something that's been, that's science-based and has been tested for your safety. Because the thing as a master gardener that I hear is people don't want to can because they're afraid they're going to hurt somebody with their produce and with their, what they preserved. So you won't have any problem with that after we get through with our video. Okay, so all that we need to do today is you need canning jars, which are in our canner in the back, and rims and lids like this and like this. And right now, Master Food Preservers is saying, stick with the big name brands, uh, Her or Ball, which are owned by the same company. There are lots of other things out there, but if you have a choice, choose those. Um, for now, that's, that's, uh, they're most reliable and everything has been tested. Um, okay, so what I try to do is preserve all my tomatoes, lots of them as sauce. So the first thing we're gonna do is, um, let's see. I'm gonna look at these tomatoes and as I go through, we're not gonna actually do the peeling because you just saw that. I'm going to only pick the ones that are nice and firm. The problem with tomatoes, as you've just found, is that they're um, just barely acidic enough, and some of them aren't, although all tomatoes are pretty acidic as far as your digestion goes. But as they get overripe, then they lose their acidity. So use things, when I go out, I usually pick things that are um, firm and look good, but they might be able to stay an extra day on the counter. So it's going to be safer if you pick the ones that are firmer because they won't have lost some of their acidity yet. Yes. So I'm going to go out and uh, we need quite a few. First of all, that canner in the back, if you can see it back there, is a regular boiling water canner. It takes quite a bit of water to fill that up. And lots of us are, all of us should be looking at conserving water. So we want to wait until we have a whole bunch of tomatoes. But what, what, if, what if your garden isn't big enough? to get enough tomatoes all at once to be able to justify using your uh, water bath canner? How do you, yeah. how do you work that? That's a, that's a really good question. So what I do is you take them and you pick them in the morning when, everything, when they haven't been stressed. You put them in uh, boxes in your garage and space them apart a bit so that they're not touching each other and they'll last a bit longer that way. The other thing you can do is go through and do what Shannon and Suzanne showed you as far as the blanching. I like to do that first because my uh, freezer ends up being sort of a black hole. <laughs> I put things in there and then I forget. So if I blanch them and they're all ready to go, then as soon as I have enough, I deem enough, then we'll go through and make tomato sauce. You can do this with anything, with any amount of tomatoes, but really that's an awful lot of water and a lot of energy to, you know, for one little jar of tomatoes. So okay. if you just have a few, blanch them, mm -hmm. freeze them, and let that accumulate two or three times until you have enough to be able to do a full recipe. Exactly, exactly. So it's usually you need to have about 35 pounds for a full counter load of quarts. So I don't use quarts. For my husband and I, we use a pint. So for dinner, this is what we use. And you know, you want to think about how you use tomatoes. You want to use everything you can. And so um, if we do quarts, we just end up putting it in the refrigerator and then, you know, it's another <laughs> black hole there. So, um, okay, so now we talked about how many we need. Um, so today, I, today we can, I have, you know, when you're canning the tomatoes, Kathleen told you a little bit about the different types of tomatoes. You can do it with any, like I said, but the ones that are more paste-like tomatoes, 
They have, some of them have bigger spaces on the inside, but definitely fewer seeds. So you get more meat. It takes you a, a shorter amount of time to go ahead and cook it up. So, so the paste like tomatoes will cook down more quickly and you won't have to spend as much time, but you can exactly. use any tomato to make the sauce. Exactly. And if you're really patient, you can even use cherry tomatoes <laughs> if any of them last. So here we've got some tomatoes and it's a variety, as you can see, that we're going to go ahead and they've uh, I actually did these this morning. I blanched them, removed the skins, and now I'm going to have Steve go ahead, and he's already washed his hands. Everything is clean. The, the counters have all been cleaned, and it would be nice if you had a knife, and if you cut them and just put them back in there, that would be great. Um, and so he's going to cut them up. I think, you know, some people just go ahead and keep them whole like that. Um, to me, it's uh, it just takes, goes a little bit faster if you have them in smaller pieces. Then we're going to put them on the stove and cook them down. And there again, it's all up to you. So it's only tomatoes that you're putting in. You're not putting in any uh, summer squash or herbs or anything else that you have to think about where, what's happening with my acidity level. It's just tomatoes. We are going to go through and acidify um, them before we can them. So we'll be really good. Uh, let's see. So, um, and I suppose if you want to add other things to it or add seasonings of things, you can do that after you've canned it when you're going to cook it and use it. Yes, absolutely. You can totally do that. Now, if you're one of those people that goes through and cooks a lot of Italian food, um, then you may just want to do an Italian sauce, but you really need to have an approved recipe. In our uh, uh, our resource page. This is one of the resources that you can have. It's awesome, it's free, it's all science-based recipes, and it tells you exactly how long you need to process um, and all about the acidification and what you can add in, but don't vary those, those recipes. If you, especially if you're just starting to stick with how it is, okay? Uh, let's see, so you wanna go ahead and sterilize the jars. And if you, if they're, they, they need to be very clean. I always sterilize. If you're processing for a long time, like you do with tomatoes, you don't necessarily have to um, boil them for 10 minutes. A 10 minute boil on sterilizing jars is for something that you're only going to process for under 10 minutes. So since these are 35 minutes, once I get the sauce cooked down, then we're going to go ahead and take the jars out. So Steve, that looks perfect. Thank you very much. And so all of these we will go through and dump them in a pot and cook it down. I watch the pot level and I like to have it cooked down mm, at least, at least a quarter, usually closer to a half. So I'll watch the volume on my pot and cook it down until it's about half. What I do at that point is I take it and I use uh, an immersion blender or, um, or uh, I put it in the uh, food processor or blender and I get it really fine because I do like it really fine um, and not a lot of chunks. It's totally up to you what you're going to do. So that's the thickness and mm -hmm. chunkiness or smoothness is all just a matter of taste. It doesn't mm -hmm. affect the safety of the recipe. Exactly and you're going to cook it down to what you like. So if you like a really thick sauce or you want to make paste, then you just cook it down until, you, until it looks good to you. So these will go in the pot. And what we're going to do, it's the magic of television. We're going to go through and not really put those in the pot. <laughs> and is that hot? Yes. OK, all right. So the pot right here. So this is a warm sauce. One thing that you want to make sure you do is you take warm sauce and you put it into warm jars and really hot sauce into hot jars. And so I'm going to have you, let's see. So here's my jars and I did turn them down but they're nice and steamy. So if you just take a couple out, I usually take two out at a time and fill them, depending on how far it is from where I'm filling the jars, because you want the jars to stay nice and warm. 
because they both need to match. Uh, you don't want like a thermal shock to happen. We're just using pipe charts. Right? Uh, just pipe charts, yes. We have an extra one. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go ahead. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to put the lid back on so that it um, so that the water stays warm. So these jars are nice and hot. Notice how I'm having Steve do all the work. <laughs> so this is citric acid, and uh, you can use citric acid or lemon juice. And you know, citric acid is nice to have just because it's it's easy. So um, as Catherine was saying, you put a quarter teaspoon of citric acid in your jar. And that's all you need to do to acidify. Put it in first, or you will forget. Okay, um, I, I've done that before, or mm, did I do that? Lemon juice, you're gonna go ahead and put a tablespoon, and it needs to be bottled lemon juice. So if I have uh, lemon trees in my garden, can I use the lemons from the lemon tree? You know, that'd be really nice. And before I knew, I did that, but Really, it's not tested as far as the acidity goes. And if you watch veggie happenings, you know that Meyer lemon trees are really uh, a cross between two trees. And one is not a lemon, one is an orange. So you need to make sure that we have it, um, the acidity is 5%. So that's so, why we use the bottled juice, so you're guaranteed to know that it's 5% acidity. Exactly. And then you can use a funnel if you have one. You don't have to have this kind of canning funnel. But it's cheap and, and easy. Makes it easier. That's right. And you know what? I there you go. Um, so he is going to go ahead and scoop up some. We need to have a quarter inch headspace, and there are funnels that will show you where a quarter inch is. Really, this last band here on the top is at a quarter inch. So you can watch that yourself. We fill them up. Headspace is important. You don't want a lot of extra air in there. It, it, it needs to pull the air out to seal it a little bit more. And nice job, Steve. <laughs> Trying try not to make too much of a mess. <laughs> no, that's okay. And you do make a mess. So that's why we have some plastic down here. Uh, okay, that looks great. So then you're going to go ahead and take the um, I use the paper towel and, you know, we don't use paper towels for hardly anything at home anymore, but we want to make sure that everything is very clean and there's no little bits of anything. Oh, we forgot to boil the lid. Do we have to do that, Toby? No, you really don't have to do that anymore. These lids are awesome now. <laughs> so all you have to do to activate it is you need to have a processing time of more than 10 minutes. So once you have a really clean top, then you put the lid on and you can, you know, put it separate. I put it together, just um, it's easier for me. And you want it fingertip tight. So not, don't crank it on there. Just have it so that there's a little room for expansion. Okay, so I'm gonna have you do one more chart and then we'll put them both in. And I'm gonna turn our canner on or up. Oh, okay, okay. So. I hooked it down a bit. We're going to do one <laughs> right now. Demonstration. Did you get the idea? Yes. And so now, if you have a jar lifter, jar lifter is great. So I'm going to go through, and he's lifting it carefully, straight up. Don't turn it. You don't want that sauce. You don't want the sauce to spill over and get underneath the lid before the lid is sealed. So then you sit it in there. Now. This is not boiling at this moment. That is okay. In fact, that's great because if it's boiling, the jars may tip over and then they might not seal correctly. So you wanna make sure that it's nice and hot, but you turn it up as soon as we get a nice boil, then we're gonna set our timer for 35 minutes. And so in 35 minutes, do you think we're done? I don't think we're quite done in 35 minutes, Toby. <laughs> Almost. <Any questions? laughs> Almost. I always throw one in there. So with, um, after the 35 minutes, then with the water bath canner, you'll take the lid off, turn the, the stove off, and then go ahead and set your timer for five minutes. And that's because the, the sauce in the jar will actually keep boiling. And mm -hmm. so you need it to um, settle down just a bit. 
Then you'll go ahead and lift it straight up and straight over and straight out. Please just let it sit there for a while. What's happened, we love to hear the little pop of the, the jar lid ceiling, which is wonderful. Um, but it takes a while. Sometimes it takes 12 hours. Usually not, but usually once the jar is all nice and cool, they will have sealed correctly. So I want you to notice too that these are, this is the way I store mine. I, after they're nice and cool, I let them sit about a day. Then I wipe it all down uh, with soapy water and I leave it, I put it uh, someplace where it's nice and cool. I have a nice cool garage, so. And I noticed Toby also you've written on here what you've canned and the date that you've canned it on uh -huh. so you don't forget. Exactly. And I, most people um, don't put the process, but Master Food Preservers does recommend you put the process. With um, tomatoes, the only way I personally would put the process is if I did pressure cook them. And then I would put the time also just to remind me. Uh, let's see if I've forgotten anything else. We sterilize the jars. Um, we label the jars. And now you're all set. So now my goal is to have, um, well, probably 60 pint jars done before the tomato season is over and that should last me through the winter. So we hope you used your tomatoes and uh, it's not a scary process. It's very easy. Just don't forget to acidify. Sounds good, thank you, Toby. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Toby and Steve. It's good to find out why we do all those things too and how that helps keep us safe. Okay, so the first question is for Kathleen and uh, it's from Kathy. It says, regarding bottled lemon juice, many natural lower production brands don't include an acidity on the label. Are they still okay to use? I would not. Um, they need to be clearly labeled that they're 5% uh, acidity. Um, don't take a chance and use something that's not labeled very often. Um, it will not be the correct amount. Okay. Thanks. And then another question for Kathleen. Um, you state not to rinse meats before cooking in order to keep the microbial bacteria down. Yet I think some chicken have chlorine on them. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Could you please clarify that? Thanks. Um, research has been done that, uh, and actually the person that answered that asked this question, I sent her a direct email um, from a government source, but it is unsafe because you run the risk of spreading uh, microbes and bacteria to, you know, other surfaces that will contaminating will contaminate other foods that you're working with. Okay. Um, and then um, the next question is, what is the name of the research science-based booklets you're referring? referring to regarding acidity. I think there are quite a few of those, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. I think that's me. So first of all, this resource um, is awesome and I'm, it's on our list. So you can go ahead and look it under up. And this one is from, it's from the USDA, but I, I, it's on a National Center for Home Food Preservation. So those are, it's really great, straightforward guide, guide, guidance. It also, the So Easy to Preserve is one that I use all the time because, you know, these are all research-based recipes and uh, it has a whole section at the beginning of tomatoes telling you about acidification. Okay, um, there's another question regarding acidification. Um, they needed the name again of the acid powder, the citric acid. Yep. It is citric acid, and you can get that most places. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's available. You can get it online also. So, um, but you know, Sebastopol Hardware, um, uh, Friedman's. Friedman's, lots of lots of places have it. So, yeah, I found pretty much any place that sells canning supplies has the citric acid. Another question for the the sauce team. It looks like you're leaving the seeds in the tomatoes when making the sauce. I sauce my tomatoes and remove the skins and seeds. You sure can do that. I mean, I, 
I like the seeds in there. Now, some people, like if you have somebody in your family that has diverticulitis or something like that, you need to take them out. One thing you need to know is there are a lot of seeds in, in regular tomatoes, not the paste tomatoes. But um, so when you go through and use a food mill or a strainer or however you take it out, it's quite a bit. So if you have a variety of tomatoes in your garden, my recommendation would be just to, you know, can them with the seeds. But if you don't like them, that's okay too. My, my chickens will eat all the seeds, but, uh, you know, try to, I try to get things that I can eat. Oh, we have a good question about sterilizing jars. Can you do that in the oven? No, it is unsafe. Okay. And, um, also, it says, I would like to have your recipe since I couldn't write and watch you at the same time. Where can I get that? And that is at, it's National Center for Home Food Preservation. They have the recipes. You can look up um, the Master Food Preserver. I'm sure Kathleen will post it on our Facebook page as well. Super easy though. And all you need to do, you decide on how many tomatoes you have. Just make it worth worthwhile. I try to go through and use my steam canner to do as many things as I can, but um, I can't, uh, <clears throat> you can't use a steam canner when you're processing tomatoes because the, well, I don't, because the processing time is too long. <clears throat> it would be pretty close. You could probably do it, but we recommend use water bath canner. Okay. Um, and then there's another question about canners. Can you use an aluminum? Well, you just answered that. Can you use an aluminum steam canner to water bath? And we just answered that that would not be the, the right thing for something yeah. with the processing time this long. And you know what you have, it's up to 45 minutes you can use the steam canner for, and these are 35 minutes. The, the problem is there's only, you know, a couple inches of water in there. And so I know me, when it goes up, it's, it's you know, to get it up to level, I'm gonna lose some. Uh, it's close enough that I wouldn't use a steam canner, but if you think, I mean, it's 45 minutes or um, more is, is what you can't use a steam canner on, so. Okay. Um, and then we have two questions from Anne. The first one is for Suzanne. Where can I buy the Hawaiian salt here in Sonoma County? Gosh, I don't know where you can. You got to find somebody who's going to Hawaii, number one, or number two, you can buy it online. Um, Amazon does have Hawaiian salt, but I personally don't know of any place here in Sonoma County where you can buy it. <clears throat> okay. And then the next question uh, is probably for anyone. I've always sterilized my jars in the dishwasher when I make jams. Is this not recommended? Um, yeah. You can clean them in the, in the dishwasher. And I'm sure that maybe some dishwashers have something that's a, you know, a, a sterilizing mode, but Really, when you make jam, um, it's got a short processing time, usually, okay? So you're only going to process for the ones that I've been making are about five minutes. So um, you do want to make sure your jars are sterilized. So we recommend going through and uh, sterilizing them in boiling water for 10 minutes. Um, I agree, yes. Okay, um, and I think that's it for the questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and show that QR code once again. So give you a chance to get your phone and take a picture of the QR code, which is of course the link to the food gardening resources page on the Master Gardener website and has links to all the tomato references for today. Um, and you can also search the food gardening resources in our site's search box. Um, we do have a variety of Master Gardener platforms, including our website, the YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. So this slide also provides the information desk email right here. So if you have questions about growing veggies, that would be the place to, to send those questions. Um, 
And also, if you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener, right now we're accepting applications for next year's class and the cutoff date for submitting your questions uh, or submitting your application is September 24th. So check it out and uh, hopefully you'll be joining us. So I just want to check the Q&A again. Looks, I think we're all done. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and um, once again, both the, both the master food preservers and the master gardeners are under the, the umbrella of the University of California. And you'll be getting a sh very brief survey sent out from the Agricultural and Natural Resources Department. Um, and we hope you'll fill it out and help us improve in the future because we do value your feedback and we do wanna um, help make these programs beneficial to you. So the recording of today's event will be on our YouTube page, YouTube channel. And you'll also find prior veggie happenings and a lot more. And um, there's also a link to the YouTube channel on our Master Gardener homepage. That's kind of like the starting point for everything. So thanks so much for joining us today and happy gardening and happy preserving. Thanks so much.